I am delighted to introduce um, uh, our speaker, Taylor Croissant. He's a minister at Southminster United Church. Uh, he's had a variety of experiences from serving in Northern Alberta to uh, South Korea. I warn you that he's from Medicine Hat and probably supports the Medicine Hat Tigers. Um, <laughs> but I'm sure he has other redeeming qualities. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to say any more. Uh, w w he's in great respect in our community uh, uh, as church leader. And I invite him to speak on our subject, uh, Will the Church Survive the Pandemic? <clears throat> Taylor. Thanks for the very kind invitation to speak with you all today. Uh, I understand that this topic was suggested by a member of the SACPA board who does not have a religious affiliation. Uh, I was, he was just curious about how faith communities have weathered the storm that was COVID-19. Uh, I appreciate you taking an interest in our welfare. I am a cleric of the Christian religion, specifically the United Church of Canada. I feel I can only speak from our perspective. However, the Downtown Ministerial Association did meet last week, uh, so I'm very fortunate to have received their input in preparing these words for today. This presentation will have an explicitly Christian worldview, only for the sake of the arguments that I will be presenting. However, I'm sure that the non-Christian faith communities have experienced many of the same difficulties as the Christian churches. Their omission here will not be out of disregard. Okay, I'll share my experience of the pandemic. On March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, I arrived in Lethbridge to be interviewed for the ministry vacancy at Southminster United Church. I checked in for my overnight stay at the Sandman Lodge downtown. A wedding reception was just beginning. The next day, the entire hotel was abandoned. The pandemic had arrived. What was initially hoped to be just a few weeks off continued to extend until I began my position in August. This created the first challenge that almost all communities of faith needed to address. How to create worship experiences for our members to engage them from their homes. In our case at Southminster, that meant recording and broadcasting videos for Sunday worship. We had to purchase a new high quality camera and to reconfigure our sound system for producing pre recorded videos. Our extremely talented office manager, Tyna Arnell, taught herself how to use video editing software and how to make these videos easily available to our members. The learning curve was steep, and we certainly learned a lot. But one of the only benefits of the pandemic for churches has been that this has forced us into the 21st century and to adopt this technology to broadcast our weekly worship. And this has been a tremendous benefit to our homebound members who are not able to attend church in person anymore. Once churches got a handle on the video recording and broadcasting stuff, the next challenge that we face was maintaining connections with people in our congregations. I had a fairly unique experience in this, in that I worked for my church for almost a, a whole year, and I never met the members of my church face to face. I had to phone through the church directory and introduce myself. You know, a metaphor that I've used to explain this period of my ministry at Southminster, it was like landing a plane in dense fog, relying upon air traffic control. I didn't know who needed a phone call or if anyone had become infected with COVID. I had to rely upon the office staff and the members of the church council. They had to guide me on whom I should be phoning. You know, thank God for Zoom. Um, we are all able to conduct our meetings and to have informal gatherings as well for members of the congregation to connect with each other, not just speaking with me. That's another thing that seems to have stuck with us in the pandemic, that when it's minus 30 outside, we don't bother driving to the church for a council meeting. We just have it on Zoom. 
A lot of that work addressed the third challenge that faith communities faced in the pandemic, and that is finances. Certainly, we are not alone in that difficulty. Many businesses in our community were ravaged by the pandemic, as well as other nonprofit organizations like us as well. We were very fortunate to have many faithful givers to keep us afloat, but we lost other traditional sources of revenue, such as fundraising and rentals. Finances continues to be the biggest challenge that faith communities are facing as a result of COVID-19. These are three very tangible challenges that we face, providing online worship, keeping our membership connected, and finances. But here are three intangible challenges that we have faced. Offering spiritual or pastoral care in a time of great despair. People were not just very socially isolated from staying at home or anxious about their jobs or businesses. The pandemic also included a very serious risk to people's health and the potential for death. Being forced, faced with our own mortality shook a lot of people. I kind of suspect that it broke some people's brains, unfortunately. But the prevailing challenge was overcoming despair. As faith leaders, we tried to bring comfort and hope to people in very dark times, while we ourselves needed to combat our own feelings of hopelessness and despair. This is one of the strengths of religion, that we contextualize our own lives in the common stories of our faith. We can feel that we are not alone or unique in our experiences because we frame it with the themes and motifs of our religion. So in the sermons that I would shared with my congregation, I drew heavily upon the stories from the Hebrew Bible to bring meaning to the suffering that we were collectively experiencing in the pandemic. So we have Noah's Ark, the 40 days sheltering inside a boat from the great flood, which destroys the world. We have the story of the Exodus, where God leads Moses and the Hebrew people through the desert wilderness for 40 years until they reach the promised land. But the one that I found myself coming back to the most often in the pandemic was the story of the exile. In the year 586 before the Common Era, the Babylonian Empire conquered the city of Jerusalem. The temple on Mount Zion was completely destroyed. And a large portion of the population was taken back to Babylon to be re-educated as good citizens of the Babylonian Empire. Every book of the Hebrew Bible touches upon this experience in some way, but the most overt are the books of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the minor prophets. All of them are written in response to the devastation of their country that was experienced in the exile. Our experience in the pandemic opened up the meaning of these scriptures in entirely new ways for me. Another intangible challenge that our churches have faced has been the polarization within politics being exacerbated by the pandemic. This trend had already been running hot with the presidency of Donald Trump in the United States, but the pandemic really blew the lid off of this in ways that have not still entirely fully revealed themselves. And there were flashpoints for this. Uh, the first was over the restrictions on public gatherings. It was hard enough for us to prepare videos for worship, but it was very difficult to navigate things like funerals. Some communities of faith in this province simply disregarded these public health orders from AHS. The most famous of these was the Grace Life Church outside of Edmonton, where AHS had to install fencing around their building to prevent people from gathering in groups over 50 people. 
The next incident turned that situation entirely upon its head with the murder of George Floyd by a police officer in Minneapolis, Minnesota. There was such an outpouring of anguish in response to that event. People had been trapped inside for months and even despite that shared suffering that we were all enduring in the pandemic, any feeling of solidarity in this hardship was crushed by that callous act of disregard of George Floyd's life. Uh, even in a pandemic, we need to witness this hatred and barbarity. People took to the streets in disobedience of limitations on public gathering. Demonstrations were held in cities across the United States, but also across the world. In Washington, D.C., protests became so fierce that President Trump was placed in a secure bunker under the White House. The president ordered a show of force against protesters, tear gassing neighboring St. John's Episcopal Church. The priest who was tending to the injured was forced to flee with the crowds. Donald Trump emerged from the bunker to pose for a photo op outside of the church that he had valiantly conquered, holding up a copy of the Holy Bible, upside down. <laughs> <laughs> Regrettably, President Trump ended up fueling the next political issue which flared up in Christian churches, the use and efficacy of vaccines to combat coronavirus infection. Mercifully, I was able to preach gratitude for the miracle of modern medicine that the mRNA vaccines represented and encouraged the members of our church to receive their shots as soon as they were eligible. However, this was highly divisive in other denominations and the clergy struggled to maintain the peace between people on both sides of this issue within their congregations. However, this political polarization reached its apex with the trucker convoy protests in our own country. Our churches were insulated when the politics were contained to our neighbors to the south, but once the political extremism became more localized, keeping peace within our congregations became tremendously hard. This has still not been resolved in Lethbridge, as court dates for the accused plotting the murder of an RCMP officer at the Coots blockade have seen protest gatherings at the courthouse in support of their, in the recent months, and they are invoking Christian messaging to further their cause. And I will say unequivocally as a Christian leader in Lethbridge that I denounce this use of the Christian faith to advocate violence in our community. The final intangible challenge that I believe we as faith communities, specifically leaders of these communities have wrestled with in the pandemic is uncertainty. At no point did we know what was the correct course of action to take? When was the correct moment to return to in-person worship, for example? For Christian traditions that have a central administrative authority, such as a bishop, it was that person who made the call after speaking with the province's chief health officer. For more congregationalist churches, those decisions had to be made internally. How long do we require masking? How should we share Holy Communion? Wandering through the fog that was that uncertainty was hard on our faith leaders. We often had to defend our decisions to parishioners who thought that we were being overly cautious, as well as those who thought that we were not being cautious enough. This uncertainty continues in many ways, and it leads me to the question 
which has been posed by the title which I offered for today's presentation. Will the church survive the pandemic? In a way, there's a simple answer to this. Oh, yes. Yes, the Christian church will go on. It's one of the oldest and most robust institutions in human history. It has survived persecution during the Roman Empire. Uh, it not only survived in the Great Depression, but actually was able to be a means of social support in that very difficult time in our country. Levels of religiosity have ebbed and flowed throughout the history of Christianity. But the challenges currently faced by individual congregations will be daunting for the remainder of this decade. Our churches have struggled to get their attendance back to their pre-pandemic numbers. And I'll credit my United Church colleague, Reverend Trevor Potter at MacKillop United Church here in Lethbridge, who has been researching what churches experiencing following the Spanish flu at the end of World War I. It will take several years for congregations to rebuild their membership. The decline of religious participation existed before the pandemic, however. All of the trends that were already in existence prior to COVID-19 have only been sped up as a result of the pandemic. You know, I really should have had Dr. Bibby here to speak with you today if you wanted more statistically based analysis. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead with a prediction. Uh, I'll hesitate to put a number on it, but we will lose a significant number of faith communities in Lethbridge before the end of the 2020s. Just knowing the struggles that we at South Minster are having with the blessing of a building that generates revenue for us in rentals, things are going to be difficult for a lot of congregations. As the pandemic has moved past the emergency phase, I recognize that the pandemic is still ongoing and still a major crisis for the healthcare sector, but not quite the emergency that it was at this time last year. Churches will also struggle going forward with, in the pandemic, uh, in finding their purpose. Especially for us churches that make up the downtown ministerial. We have seen the devastation that surrounds us in downtown Lethbridge. The housing crisis, the addictions crisis. Our faith compels us to do something. Our purpose as Christians is to serve others, especially the most marginalized members of our society. You know, just south of this building and my church, the tent uh, encampment was right beside us all summer. You know, we want to do something to help, especially so for us United Anglican and Roman Catholic churches as so much of these very serious social issues can be directly connected with our denomination's histories in running Indian residential schools. Because of our own struggles trying to hold our congregations together right now, our inability to offer support that would make a difference in the face of these multiple crises is quite chastening. So what will be our church's purpose rather than just keeping the doors open? <laughs> if you are not religious, you might ask, well, who cares? Many businesses and nonprofits permanently shuttered as a result of the pandemic. Who cares if we add faith communities onto that pile? I'll just use Southminster as an example. We have the largest seating capacity in Lethbridge, aside from the NMAX Center. We operate this space as a nonprofit. That means that we charge our renters only to cover the expenses of our building's utilities. Our intention for our building is to serve as a community hub 
And we house many other community groups in our space. The Lethbridge Symphony Orchestra, Canadian Mental Health, Blankets for Canada, Sportball, Zumba, Roller Derby, Elections Canada, all manner of concerts, particularly the Geomatic Attic, community interest groups such as the Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs. We can decide what kind of rent that we charge if we think these groups are enriching our community. If this space becomes privatized and is run for a profit, it will eliminate the benefit that these other nonprofit community groups receive with access to our space. Faith communities provide what is called a halo effect to their surrounding neighborhood. Speaking to our own experience, in the disruption the pandemic has brought, I believe new opportunities for the Christian faith will emerge. And I personally have attempted to be a catalyst for a major one. <clears throat> During the pandemic, the United Church of Canada held its triennial general council. It was originally planned to be held in person in Calgary, uh, but it was forced to be held online. And I was the author of a proposal which came from our regional council, which comprises all of Southern Alberta, to the National Church's General Council, suggesting that the United Church initiate a multilateral ecumenical dialogue with the Anglican, Lutheran, and Presbyterian churches to discuss over the course of the next decade the possibility of joining our denominations into a full organic union. This proposal was passed last summer at the General Council meeting with 75% of commissioners being in favor. Possibilities which seemed highly unlikely just five years ago have now blossomed like a flower in the desert of COVID. God was still at work in the world and in the hearts of God's people, despite our attention being focused solely on our survival. When I posed this question of the church's survival to the downtown ministerial, one commonality which we expressed was gratitude for the people who had remained faithful throughout the pandemic. The members of our churches followed us through the depths of despair in the worst days of the pandemic. We faith leaders feel that if we can go through the worst of COVID-19 together, we can go through anything together. Like the Israelites who were freed from their exile in Babylon, all we need is a faithful remnant who remain faithful to God's call. Our churches are built on hope and faith. A common image shared by most religions is that of a small, hopeful light conquering our fears in the darkness. The fog of COVID uncertainty shrouds the ways that our faith communities will be changed by the past three years. But we will endure only because we have demonstrated our resilience in the face of the worst that COVID could throw at us. For those gathered here today, I wish to offer my gratitude for your contributions in keeping nonprofit organizations alive in our communities, both religious and secular, including the Southern Alberta Council on Public Affairs. And my thanks for inviting me to speak with you today. <laughs> Thank you.
I'm just going to ask you to stand over there so people can address you. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've got an extra little bit of time for Q&A, and I invite you to, uh, so you may want to move your chairs forward a little bit so people can line up along this wall as you want to uh, ask a question. You can give me something in print, and I'll, um, I'll, I'll offer it on your behalf if you don't want to use the mic. However, I invite you to come and uh, engage with uh, Taylor in some of the interesting uh, threads that you wove together. Uh, so, so we're open for questions. I'll ask you to give your name and uh, speak into the mic uh, as well as look at uh, <laughs> this guy here. Okay. Thanks, Terry. Yep. Uh, good morning and thank you very much for your uh, insightful presentation. I'm Maria Fitzpatrick and I'm a member at McKillop. I'm also on uh, one of the church committees. So we've had lots of discussion about uh, the changes since the pandemic happened. And uh, the committee I'm on is Ministry and Personnel. So uh, it was a concern about uh, salaries, it was a concern about how many people would remain on staff. Um, I'm sure you had similar uh, issues. How did you deal with those kinds of things? <laughs> Wide question. <laughs> Well, thank you for the question. Um, I'm very proud that we can say at South Minster that we did not lay anyone off during the pandemic. We kept all of our folks employed uh, and we, we incorporated all those folks into uh, the preparing of the worship videos which we did each week. So we did not have um, recorded music that we, you know, got off the internet elsewhere. It was our musicians that recorded it every week. They sang into the microphone. They, it was inserted uh, through editing into the service that we provided on video. Uh, and that is how we were able to keep people engaged. And uh, the jobs of everyone that was employed by our church really sort of changed directions. People were doing totally different things. Like Tina was here today and like her, her job was, was quite different from what she's doing now because yeah. she handles most of the rentals at our building. So uh, I don't think every church was as fortunate as us to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and their finances have not reached the place where they may be able to bring back the people that they had to let go, unfortunately. So it's been very disruptive, I think, to uh, many congregations within Lethbridge. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Fiona Jacobs. So um, I'm sitting there trying to form a question, but to what extent, okay, so COVID was a period of enforced reflection. Whether you wanted to reflect or not, you had the time to do it. And um, so, and some people reflected for the good and some people reflected for nothing. I mean, they just wanted to get back to the status quo. And some people wanted to reflect for maybe not so positive reasons. Um, so two, two questions, I guess. One is, um, have you, when you talk about the, the, the uh, foretelling of a smaller denomination, do you not, know, whatever, congregation is not the word of it. Have you reached out to the people who aren't coming back to find out sort of what conclusions they drew? And the other thing is, to what extent do you know what audience virtually you've attracted? Thank you. Great questions. Um, well, it was not always philosophical retrospection. I, I watched Tiger King too and had my opinions about Carol Baskin as well. It was not always serious sort of things. Uh, but you're right, like, how have we connected with those fields? So we were very intentional at Southminster. We phoned every single person through the directory when we were returning to in-person worship. So like I phoned those people during the pandemic as well, but we said, okay, we're coming back. Uh, and we've continued to do that now every fall as we get at the end of summer, we're, we're phoning through the directory. That's a good practice that we've developed. Uh, one reality of ministry is when there is a change in the pastor, uh, some people just leave the church when they don't come back and people who had been away, they, they decide that's their time to re-engage. So we don't know how much of that 
for us was, was just that sort of normal churn that happens with the change of ministry personnel. Uh, but there's some people that just have vanished. That like we, we phone them and cannot get a hold of them. They're just, for whatever reason, not interested in re-engaging. For our online stuff, that has been so interesting, is that, you know, we're not a Lethbridge church in some ways. Like, we're a church that serves internationally. We had a lady who just gave us a check last week from San Diego, California. Here's, here's some money. Thank you for doing Because she is she knows someone that's a member of our congregation. And she said, hey, you should check out our church. So now we have people that tune in from uh, Barhead every week. We got someone from San Diego, as we said, members of our church that, you know, go south for the summer, as, uh, in the winter rather, as snowbirds. <laughs> They're in uh, Arizona and Hawaii, and someone said, yeah, they, they just are on a cruise around the world right now, and they, they check in where I'm, where I'm watching from today. So that's been such an interesting thing, and you know, we want to value these people. We don't want to just take that for granted that these people have been tuning in. We want to, okay, well, let's make sure that just the way that we would phone the people who are people in Lethbridge that are our members, we want to make sure that we're phoning and connecting with those people too and just see how they're doing as well. So thanks, that's a very good question. Thanks, Taylor and Mary Shillington. Um, I don't know what your... Um, outreach for children was at Southminster, uh, uh, you know, young children, babies, daycare, uh, the kind of the nursery, and, and so on, and teenagers. I just know what's happened at McKillop, and that really concerns me because there has been no, uh, to my knowledge, no movement towards uh, reuniting that, relighting that kind of work with children other than uh, three teenage boys who are going to a teenage group, mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of which is our grandson. So tell me what's happened, because this is the future of the church, and if those children are not brought up in the church, where will the church be? Thanks, Mary. Uh, good question. Um, Unfortunately, that is one of those things in the pandemic that sort of came off of the plate for a lot of churches that we were just barely able to, you know, tread the water. So a lot of engagement for children and youth, that, that sort of became restricted. Uh, we did attempt some things, but we discovered that, you know, these kids are attending school still. They're watching their videos to attend school. They're not interested in another activity that you know, let's let's have a Zoom thing to have Sunday school or whatever. So when we did sort of explore those sort of things, we, we found it was, it was not the right tact. Uh, and we've discussed at our church council, like that is a, a glaring omission that we currently have is that, you know, that stuff sort of was put on a back burner in the pandemic. We need to re-engage with that. Uh, I, I think we've done not bad. We've got an active Sunday school, uh, you know, chugging along. I, I'd certainly like to double its attendance, as all churches would. Uh, but you, you have identified something that is a is something that all of our churches need to be working on going forward from this moment. Hello, my name is uh, Knut Peterson. Uh, while I'm not a member of any church, uh, I really super appreciate the uh, South Minister because I've attended a lot of functions in that church, Geomatic uh, Attic. We even hosted uh, the premier in that church a few years ago, if anybody remember that. Uh, but my question relates a little bit more towards uh, the homeless, uh, the housing crisis in Lethbridge. I wonder if you've given any thought to letting people in your wonderful gymnasium, which is attached to the church, uh, as a warming center, for example, when, uh, when it's uh, a little bit cooler than it is right now. Mm. Thank you. Um, we did have a, a request from, I think it was the mustard seed, early, early on when I arrived, to inquire about just that 
uh, sort of proposal. And we concluded that we were probably not able to do it because our building is always full and busy with activities, then we wouldn't be able to carve out that space. But um, yeah, it's, it's a really huge ask. There have been other churches, not in Lethbridge, but in other churches across Canada who have uh, undertaken that exact um, proposal and found it very challenging because it required, you know, now it's, it can't just be volunteer run, it needs to be people that are trained uh, to deal with sort of mental health and addiction issues. And with great goodwill to, to run something like that, it, it starts up for about two months and then it falls on its face very spectacularly. Uh, that, to, to have like a warming center like that, to, I wish we'd, we'd consider again about having uh, a safe injection site as well, perhaps not where it was located, but elsewhere. Uh, that, those kind of things require the resources of a government to be run effectively, I feel. Uh, as much goodwill and desire as we have, you know, we have a very small volunteer base that are just barely able to maintain the, the bare minimum functions of our church and to take on a really big project like that is sort of beyond us. So, where we can be effective is uh, in advocacy with the government and to say this is something we think that we need in our community. So it's not a satisfactory answer, but it's an honest answer, though. Hi, I'm Barb McNeely Sears, and I just, during the pandemic, it brought to view to the public that all the service workers and volunteers and nurses and post workers and grocery clear everybody and i just wondered and that's kind of dropped off like now it's like oh well they're back to <laughs> anyway and i just wondered how to keep that awareness in the public and also did it bring more volunteers out to the church because they saw how important all that service was to especially during the pandemic thank mm. you Yeah, it's, I don't know, the, the, the pandemic really made me a sort of a labor radical in many ways because, uh, you know, I, you would go to the, so the grocery store, for example, and, and I'm just, I want to get in and out as quickly as possible. There are people that are required to be in there to w be employed uh, to make sure that that's functioning. And uh, it was distressing about how sort of, disposable. We, f we found so much service jobs in our economy that, well, yeah, of course a person is going to deliver DoorDash to me in my house. So that's, yeah, that's required. If I have a white collar job, I can just work from, from home on a computer. The, ex the pandemic was experienced very differently from people that worked in different employment sectors. Uh, as for volunteering, it's been, I don't want to criticize people because I know a lot of the members of my church are here today, but oh boy, are we, <laughs> we're pulling teeth to, because people got out of the habit of doing a lot of their stuff. So we got to, hey, we need someone to, to do coffee after Sunday. We were always on top of people about that. So no, I don't think that people have returned back to the uh, volunteering levels that we experienced before the pandemic. Hi, Ken Sears. Um, this is going to be more inside baseball, but the United Church and the other mainline churches, the evangelicals I think are a different dynamic, are not just in Lethbridge. They have a historical presence in pretty much every small community uh, across the country, but let's just focus on Southern Alberta. What has the impact been on the membership and the engagement in the United Church in these smaller communities? Is that, did it sort of hold on or did it continue its gradual decline or what was going on there? And just as an ancillary question, it's unfair because it's a different, as I said, it's a different dynamic. Has the same, has there been the same impact on the evangelical churches and the fundamentalist churches that you're aware of in the province? 
Thanks for the question. Uh, my spouse is also a United Church minister, and she serves in Fort McLeod and Granham, so I do uh, get uh, the vicarious experience of uh, people in rural ministry as well. Uh, similar challenges that we were saying about being a community hub, but it means more in rural communities uh, in that it's not just that I'm losing the ability to put on a fall supper and do fundraising and raise money. That's a place where a lot of people in those communities uh, meet each other, socialize, uh, make connections as well. Uh, the church serves a lot of that community building function in rural communities to a far greater degree than it does in our urban churches. As for the evangelical bent of churches, they are experiencing the same level of decline now as mainline Protestant denominations, as Roman Catholic denominations. All churches of all faith traditions, all are experiencing the same level of decline at this point now. Uh, there's nothing that, that sort of stratifies us out. So um, yeah, all of the things that I was speaking with about today all that came from the ministerial that we had and we have mainline people we have roman catholics we have evangelicals as part of that group these are all the things that we all shared together that we said that we're experiencing <laughs> hi my name is Carol Sakia. Uh, thanks. I'm sorry I missed the first part of your talk. Looks like I could read it here. Clearly into the mic, Carol. Carol Sakia. Anyway, um, so as a non-Christian member of this community, I was kind of interested, but a little surprised to hear that this motion got passed at this Calgary forum. The national. It was national. Oh, national. Okay, and uh, and it, and it passed so highly. Mm -hmm. But I thought there was already a sort of an ecumenical council in existence. Mm -hmm. There, there is. Mm -hmm. Is this new to mm -hmm. something? Okay, so if you could maybe talk a bit more about that, <laughs> okay, and. Yes. Um, just for those of us that don't know anything yes. about that stuff. Sure. And uh, I'd like to know if the group in Lethbridge, the, the local ecumenical group that you might now create, um, if they could do some of that advocacy that Knut was referring to, is like, okay, maybe you can't be a warming center in your church, but let's somehow get together as citizens of any religious or whatever background, non-religious background, and get our city council and maybe our provincial government to think a little deeper about taking care of humanity. So that's sort of the one question. The other thing I had about um, why are people, you know, losing members uh, to various churches, and I, I worry that it's got to do with what's happened to society is the haves and the have-nots. And uh, I just think that that whole capitalism thing has drained people of humanity and I don't see it getting better. So anyway, those are my comments. Okay. Thank you, Carol. Shout out if I forget something, because there were, there were three items in there. So first is about um, sort of ecumenism. So churches in Canada come together in a national federation called the Canadian Council of Churches. And they'll sort of do a lot of uh, work together on advocacy sort of things. The proposal that was passed at the United Churches General Council is for specifically the mainline Protestant denominations in Canada to f join together our denominations and form a new separate denomination. So what occurred in the United Church of Canada in 1925 with Methodists, Presbyterians, and Congregationalists to do that now further with Anglicans, Lutherans, and Presby the remaining Presbyterians. It's a, it's a big role, a big ask, um, but in the pandemic we, we think that all things are now possible with, with how things have changed. Um, remind me the, the second item that you discussed. Oh, is the advocacy from the ministerial. Yeah, the ministerial had, had not met during the pandemic. So um, 
we're just getting our our feet under ourselves about meeting again and we're doing our our regular activities but s subjects just like you've described yeah that that stuff that comes up with us as well and we would be very interested in speaking with sort of political leaders about uh, how we could make a positive change in the community the final one that you've uh, brought up is uh, that's a trend that's beyond religious communities as well. Um, it's sort of called the decline of third spaces, places where people can go, they don't have to spend money. Uh, belonging and membership of all kinds of organizations has declined, like service clubs like the, the Elks or the Legion. Uh, sporting clubs like bowling and curling all of those organizations are seeing a decline in membership and it's because of an atomization in society people are you know they go to work and they go home and they're just so <laughs> exhausted they put on Netflix or whatever and I just okay I, I vegetate on the couch and then I repeat it all the next day um, the pandemic was very exhausting and that that's sort of all the energy people had to do um, I hope that people are able to catch their breath and that we can be reinvigorated to to do that sort of stuff outside of our you know our our domestic life and our working life that we can participate in those other activities as well I don't see how it's gonna happen I don't I don't know if I had the answer I'd, I'd gladly share it but it is a major struggle we're all experiencing Uh, I'm Doug Neal, and I got to wonder about people that would support the Medicine Hat Tigers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, the question is, um, are we uh, really losing members of church, or is technology making it too easy for people? Uh, the church is not bricks and mortar, the church is people. And I think I know a lot of people that are just, it's too hard, it's too much effort to get up and go to church. I can press a button and get all the, uh, the needs met. I can press another button and send you money. Yeah. So why would I need to go to church? And that's, uh, how do you reach those people? You got a tough job. <laughs> <laughs> As for the Medicine Hat Tigers, like we had many decades of success, so we, we will throw you a bone here in Lethbridge. <laughs> um, I'm not even gonna use churches for to address your example. I'll, I'll use the Lethbridge Symphony Orchestra who lives in our building. Why would you go to the symphony when you could just put a CD on at home? What, what's, what's the difference? You tell me. Like there's, there's something about the in-person experience of it that people are continuing to go to the symphony. We need, as churches, we need to demonstrate that there is something different, something that's uh, more enriching by participating in religious observance in person. Uh, if we're not able to communicate it, that's a failure of us. I'm just gonna ask a question. Uh, I didn't realize two people were lining up, but I, but I have I have a question. I'd like to invite you to speculate or, or use your intuitive senses or something. But uh, it's my observation that the pandemic was really hard on the morale of some occupations. The teachers, I think, have had a difficult time mm -hmm. uh, with extra stress and extra hours put in. And there's some, and of course the whole medical field. Uh, you've had a, a, a conversations with the um, ministerial at the retired clergy. I'm curious about the morale of uh, of um, of clergy and church volunteers uh, that you sensed in your ministerial conversations. Uh, I know what's happening at McKillop, and it's been a stressful time. But how are other and smaller and more evangelical congregations? What's the morale of your colleagues? Mm. 
I'm afraid I can only answer well for the United Churches um, and that we're exhausted because the pandemic was so difficult with totally relearning how to do our jobs uh, with the, the recorded worship. Uh, and then we came back to in-person worship and that was a you know, huge Herculean effort to get that back on its feet again. We haven't really had a moment to breathe. If you, if you are a member of a church, like somehow arrange it that you can give your pastor an additional week of holidays. They really appreciate it. Uh, it's, so to answer the question, it's, it's just, you know, we're still just running on fumes in many ways. Uh, and but we realize we have to put in this 110% effort because our churches are going to suffer if we don't. So, yeah. not a satisfactory answer, I know. Bev Mundell Atherstone, thank you so much. That was uh, a very um, enlightening talk. Thank you. Mm. So, uh, I think Carol Saki approached part of this question. Uh, so, I've got sort of a lead in and then a question. And thank you very much for talking about the advocacy and the political aspect of the homeless and the polarization under Trump of the rich and the poor. Um, so I'd like you to go back to your religious studies and think about the Reformation and Calvinism, and in particular Calvin, who it seems set the groundwork for some of our disparagement of the poor in his uh, belief in the propagation that wealth is a gift from God, which then seems to indicate that those who didn't get the wealth, the poor, it's their own fault. And this myth seems to be pervasive in uh, our culture, but even more so in the U.S. where it's become political. How do you see the Christian churches with your view towards helping those who are the least, um, who are the most vulnerable and uh, the least endowed by our, our uh, political structure? How do you see them making an impact? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, uh, we as Reformed Christians in the United Church, you know, we receive our heritage uh, from Jean Calvin, and unfortunately, I think some other Christian traditions have picked up the unhelpful things <laughs> Jean Calvin had to say in his history. We should consider about the era that he was addressing, like he lived in the sort of the middle, end of the Middle Ages. Uh, people's uh, place in life was set to them at birth. People were in, inherited landowners and they had uh, aristocratic titles given to them. Uh, Jean Calvin's saying that to sort of break, break free from that mold. Like, okay, well, we'll become, you know, merchants and artisans and we'll make money instead that will not be tied to the land. And we won't get involved in things that are sinful vices like alcoholism and gambling like that. That was a, a sign of faithfulness for, for the Calvinists. But as you've said, uh, maybe picked up in the unhelpful sort of ways, uh, that just the accumulation of wealth to itself became the virtue, uh, rather than living a righteous life that might provide the benefit of, uh, you know, self-reliant income. It's, um, it's a major division within Christian churches today about um, our advocacy for the poor, whether people are impoverished uh, due to the fault of their own. Um, it, it's a, it's tied to all of those other political divisions that I discussed in my remarks. I, I can only speak to our United Church experience that we were we were born in the social gospel era at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, and it was a sort of belief that uh, through modernity, life will always continue to get better. As pro technology progresses, tomorrow will always be better than yesterday. Uh, and we in the United Church have that hard baked into us, that we have this hopeful and optimistic outlook. Uh, you know, but again, being chastened, World War I comes along and, you know, industrialization is used very efficiently to kill people. So 
we, we don't feel like we can be as um, forceful in our proclamations about society as the United Church once was about building this, you know, Christianized social order because we've realized that so much of what we've done in the past, Indian residential schools, for example, uh, how destructive it has been. So I would hope some of these other Christian denominations would sort of learn from the unfortunate example that the United Church experienced in its history. I hope that's a good answer. We're coming up to the last question, but we have time for you. Oh. And maybe one more, if there's one more question. Go ahead. <laughs> launch another zinger. <laughs> Carol? Oh, go ahead. These will be the last two questions. Um, mine is a little bit different, Carol Darmody. Um, you were, were you a minister in Korea? And how was that experience uh, like? Is uh, Christianity in South Korea on the decline like here. Um, just if you could comment on your experience mm -hmm. in Korea, thanks. Sure. Uh, well, South Korea is very different than our society. I would say that South Korea is one of the few truly Christian nations on the earth, and that might be surprising for people to hear, as they are a country in East Asia, but 30% uh, of the population identifies as Christian. And when people say they are a Christian in Korea, that means they go to church not just once a week, they go midweek, five o'clock in the morning, we're going to chapel. Uh, so they have very high levels of religiosity in South Korea. Versus in Canada, our Christianity is very cultural. People will claim to be a Christian. You know, I, I go to church on Christmas Eve, therefore I am a Christian. So very different sort of levels. I would say in South Korea, they're still holding their own. They were massive growth in the 20th century in Christianity uh, in South Korea, but it's it's sort of leveling off now. It's not, it's not declining quite as much, but it's not growing either. So it's holding at that sort of 30% level. Leona Jacobs. Um, we should have ended on Bev's because that was a zinger one, but anyway. Um, my question isn't anywhere near that, and it's actually bringing it back here and discussing a reaction to the whole COVID thing, which is about the fact that the church is a social connection for people. And so have, with, with sort of people wandering off, have you investigated that social connection and the mental health as a consequence? No, no, we haven't. No, we haven't. Um, you know, if, if you phone people up and they don't answer the phone, like, it's just, we're at the limitation of how we're able to engage with folks if, if they say that we're, we're decoupling from our religious uh, participation. We're, we're sad to see people go, but we know that, that that just sort of happens. But as you've said, like, it's possible that the, the deep levels of despair I spoke to uh, maybe overcome, overcame some people and that, you know, people could very seriously have a health, or not health, sorry, a faith crisis uh, as a result of that level of despair. Um, on the other hand, faith gave people a great deal of resilience, I think, as well. Like That is the thing that carried a lot of people where uh, I think it was especially true for younger generations uh, and people that didn't have that religious connection. The levels of despair have hit uh, quite serious levels. Uh, and that not quite to affecting so much the, the people that are more religiously engaged. So uh, I, I do think that um, the, the idea you've had that it could be uh, people disengaging from religion has ended up uh, being a consequence of depression that they may have experienced as well, or vice versa, precisely. Uh, we're just winding down, but we have a couple of rituals here, but Bev wants to okay. get, get a word in. <laughs> Um, I, I was a psychologist in my former working life. <clears throat> There's some new research to indicate that 
as people are leaving the churches and leaving other religious organizations, that they're that um, when when COVID hit, that they um, went into depression much easier because they were missing that spiritual o umbrella overlay in their life, and. Um, and maybe they're not looking for organized religion, but they still are looking for spirituality. Would you comment? Sure. Just in Brief question. Brief. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, ch church is more than just beyond, like, th that you get inspired by what I have to say. I hope you would be. <laughs> but, you know, just going, and there's someone that I socialize with, like, that's a major benefit that the, that the church provides. There, there is something to it that I'm sure like secular psychology is gonna tell us that people have a spiritual need and, and somehow need that uh, expressed. Not everyone may have it to the same levels uh, and, and don't engage it in the same way, but there is a spiritual need that's, that people have and religious participation uh, fills that need. And as you say, if, if other, not just spiritual needs, but all your other needs are not being met, like that's going to have impacts upon your mental health potentially. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, Taylor, we have a ritual that I didn't warn you about, but uh, do you have any last uh, word that you want to give to this crowd? Uh, maybe a question you hope would be asked that wasn't, or uh, a kind of closing comment? I will. <laughs> um, if you are a person that participates in nonprofit organizations, it doesn't have to necessarily be uh, religious, it could be secular ones, it could be like this, this very one that we're at today. Um, I want you to consider about what you might do extra to ensure for the robust health of those organizations. So just, I'll ask you to consider that as we leave today. It's a privilege to be in conversation with a busy guy for a whole hour, and we thank you for coming, and uh, thank all of you for uh, supporting Council of Public Affairs. Thank you. Have a good week.